Welcome, Kevin, to the Collaborative Research Center, Original Function of Meat Organisms. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you are one of the key um, experts in the microbial interaction community. Um, but when looking back to your biography, I mean, it's not easy to understand how does one end up with an expert in microbial interactions. Um, can we start by asking, um, how did you get to that field? And uh, you, um, you did many things before. You had a beautiful thesis on social on social insects. Uh, um, how how did you get in your personally to the field where you are right now? Yeah, um, so I guess I was I started off with an interest in insects. Actually, that was as a childhood. Uh, I was kind of an insect nerd, um, and then yeah, naturally started studying the social insects during my PhD because uh, they're one of the major study systems in insects, um, but also one of the major study systems for understanding anything social. So the bees, the ants, and the wasps, they have their amazing castes with a queen and workers that work their whole life without reproducing. And so they're a model system for understanding any social group. Um, and that trained me, I guess, in yeah, social evolution, sociobiology. And um, at the time I was finishing my PhD, it felt like a lot of the big questions had been answered with the social insects and how they cooperate, how they work together. Um, but there was just this exciting new world opening up, this idea that microbes might also interact, uh, that they might work in groups uh, both for and against us. And I so basically, um, yeah, I, I got uh, enticed uh, by the microbes at that point and, yeah, never looked back, really. I mean, I started off with Dictostelium, which is a slime mold. It's mm -hmm. a strange beast. Mm -hmm. Uh, spends some of its life as uh, single cells and then aggregates and makes these spores uh, and fruiting bodies. And it's uh, it's kind of like social insects in the sense that they, uh, in order to make this little fruiting body, some of the cells that aggregated have to die and hold aloft these spores. So you have sterile guys and, and uh, uh, reproducing guys, a bit like the workers and the queen, the social insects. Um, but at the same time I was studying those, I started to realize that what was more ubiquitous were the bacteria uh, bacteria everywhere, they're inside us, they're on us, they're in the environment. Um, and at the time I started working with them, people really didn't know if they were working together, what they were doing. Uh, people were starting through sequencing to realize that there was an amazing diversity. Mm -hmm. So we knew there was many different types out there, but not really what they were doing with each other. And that's what lured me in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was fascinating. Uh, as you say, I think uh, really the last decade or so has shown that this enormous um, abundance and importance of the microbial world in us and around us and, and just everywhere and that is because technology made invisible things visible um, so your research of course came at, a, at the right moment and an important moment and it now it contributes in an incredible uh, incredible important way to understanding this complex uh, microbial um, uh, world now, people talk always about the social life of bacteria, which is not so easy to understand. Uh, what is the social life of bacteria? Yeah, so it's a good question. I mean, yeah, obviously the word social means something different in bacteria to us, I guess, uh, as we would expect. But um, what it represents is the fact that bacteria often work together to solve common problems that they might have. So that might be a, a very simple one would be releasing an enzyme, so something into the environment that causes chemical reactions. Um, and that just breaks down food for them, for example. Um, so if you have one cell releasing this enzyme that breaks down uh, some molecule and feeds the cell, that's relatively inefficient because it will diffuse away from the cell. Um, however, if you have many cells doing it together, then basically they can all help feed each other and they work together um, and can do much better as a group as they might on their own. They also cooperate to defend themselves against the immune system during disease. Um, they cooperate to collect iron, again, by putting out little molecules and all these things. So they do many things uh, together uh, in a social sense. But they're also antisocial. So, you know, many of the antibiotics that we use to treat bacteria originally come from bacteria, and bacteria are also often at war. So different strains will um, uh, produce all kinds of toxins to take over competitors. So it's a, it's a very intricate social world in which they live with both positive and negative effects. And the big challenge now is to understand how the sum of those effects uh, affects the way the bacteria, you know, affect us, mm -hmm. uh, right. if you like. Yeah. When we talk about microbes, and we do it in a very loose way and often in a very undefined way, 
We usually think of bacteria, but we know that the microbial world, which is of importance, is much more than just uh, bacteria in strict to sensu. There are archibacteria, a uh, completely different group, there are viruses, and so on. So isn't that social life, what you talk about, actually a life of many different kingdoms or ranges of organisms? And they must all have invented very different languages. On the other side, they somehow cooperate or compete. Uh, now, not talking only about within the bacteria, but, but how do bacteria do that with archibacteria, with viruses? Is there anything understood in this complexity? going beyond interbacteria communication. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think yeah, I think we do know quite a lot. I mean, the I mean, when we think about uh, cells or yeah, microbes working together, the key examples of that tend to be within a group of cells that have recently divided from a single cell, so they're a clone. And so those groups from an evolutionary perspective are acting a little bit like a multicellular organism. So they have a single genotype, and that means that they're all pushing in the same direction from an evolutionary perspective. That's where we get these enzyme secretions. That's where we get them working together. Um, the moment you think about other genotypes of bacteria, that's where we see competition, you know, fighting for a niche. Um, and that is the general rule when we think about bacteria interacting with other groups. Um, certainly in the case of bacteriophage, the viruses that infect bacteria, they rarely work together with bacteria. Most of the time, they're interested in using the bacteria as a host in the same way viruses affect us and using resources of the bacteria and they're in conflict, there's competition. There are some really amazing examples where um, those phage, uh, those, those viruses are integrated into the genome of bacteria and they may carry an antibiotic resistance cassette or do some other clever trick that helps their host. And so there are moments where even a virus can help its host and they can work together. Um, the archaea, we're still, I think we're still learning a lot about them. Um, but certainly there's plenty of moments of competition and interaction between the bacteria and the archaea too. And then eukaryotes too. We have, the, we have you know, complex cells, amoebae, wandering around in our gut that are feeding on bacteria and so on. So yeah, so it's, it, you're right. It's much more complex than just bacteria. But I guess um, that's, that's where at least I started. Yeah. yeah. The amazing thing is uh, that... At the end, everything in a normal, in a healthy animal or plant is kind of in a very good homeostasis and only then by disturb, by if, if something gets wrong and uh, sickness develops, then you realize that probably some of this languaging and communicating is between the different groups is not working very well. So I think, yeah, it's fascinating to look into that in detail. Before we move on, maybe to a little bit on the, the complexity within a host, then... Um, can you define, you started with, uh, by studying social insects and you then with the, the term social evolution. Mm -hmm. um, what do we have to understand under social evolution? Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess uh, it's worth describing what evolution is, I guess, first. Uh, so evolution um, is the process of genetic change in a population over time. You know, so evolutionary adaptation, the classic examples are something like a Darwin's finch. Uh, so these birds that will uh, have evolved different beak sizes to hit different uh, sizes of seeds and eat those seeds. Um, and in that case, what we're thinking about is evolution by natural selection. So the idea is it's these particular variants in a population that will do well um, because they have the beak that allows them to get the best seeds, they outcompete and so on over generations. So that's, you know, in a very short shrift, that's, that's evolution. So what's social evolution? It's where you have the process of natural selection, but you also have to think about interactions between organisms at the same time. So you can't just think about, it's the cases where you can't just think about one individual and it's fit to its environment. It's where what it's doing is being affected by others and it is affecting those others itself. And so the classic easy example to use is the, again, the social insects. So in the social insects, you have workers, uh, worker insects that spend their entire life raising the offspring of the queen. That makes no sense from a simple perspective of evolutionary biology because they're not reproducing and they're investing in the reproduction of someone else. So this whole idea of survival of the fittest seems to make no sense until you realize, of course, that the queen is their mother and they're raising their siblings. And so in doing so, they're actually passing on their genetic information as well as if they were reproducing themselves. Um, so social evolution is the study of the cases where interactions between organisms affect the shape of natural selection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very good and, and clear. Let's uh, go back to in the keyword is interactions, and that's what we want to understand, the interactions, uh, and move back to the bacterial world. Uh, but now we realize uh, many of the 
bacterial communities are living within organisms. Um, they are essential for the well-being of an organism. If we remove them, the organism turns to get either accessible to pathogens or get sick. Or, um, so that's get very now really very complex, and that's probably the challenge, um, but also the the excitement of the new biology that uh, all of a sudden. I mean, I'm a zoologist, so I was trained to look into organisms of different kind of levels of organization. But of course, we only saw the host cell. And uh, what we say now, we even say now, the host cell. I mean, this it was only animal cell, or it's, if you're a botanist, it's the plant cell. So that's a challenge on many aspects uh, to embrace this, this complexity. And, um, and you are using... Uh, about a variety of different technologies and, and modeling um, how to, to 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 understand that complexity would you would you a little bit expand on that and um, um, address the uh, the problem of how not to not to be uh, afraid about the complexity of the, the today biology but take it as an exciting new challenging aspect to address uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so complexity is both fascinating and worrying whenever you hit it. Um, so formally, in mathematics, complexity is any system that has many parts that interact, right? And so uh, whether, you know, the, 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 all the factors that drive the weather is viewed as a complex system. The internet is a complex system. And many species of microbes interacting is also a complex system. Now, um, yeah, so... Should we be afraid of it a little bit, uh, I guess, because um, we know from complex systems that details often matter. So the challenge is the fact that small changes in some part of a complex system, which you can envisage as a network of interacting parts, small changes can have uh, large effects um, throughout a network that are, can be hard to predict. So that's the challenge we face with them. Um, that said, uh, we now have a large body of uh, mathematics and methodology to try and break down that complexity. Um, so we can represent uh, a microbial community as a network, as a series of interacting parts, and use the mathematics to identify which parts of that network, which species, say, in a community, are particularly critical for a particular behavior we're interested in. So, for example, one thing we're interested in now is um, how we are protected from salmonella. So salmonella is a bacteria that causes uh, food poisoning, uh, gastroenteritis, and... Um, what we know is most of the time you can actually you can ingest salmonella and not get sick. And the reason for that is or one of the big reasons is that our the gut micro protect us, protects us from it. So we want to understand why, you know, why does it why is it protected and how is that a product of this complex interacting set, uh, set of species? Um, and we don't know yet which species are going to be critical. We don't know yet which properties. But by using the mathematics of complex systems, we can hope to actually get a handle on those things in a way that will be more challenging with traditional methods. So in short, um, it will be challenging, and but it's also exciting. And I do think that we do have the methods to break down the complexity. Mm -hmm. And it will be important if you talk about your work on Salmonella, which has, of course, also then a, a medical and a therapeutic uh, perspective. Yeah. I think what you're going to say is that we learn that context matters, uh, yes. where a given pathogen, or if a pathogen really is virulent or not, etc. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I think maybe complexity even goes further than that, and I'm particularly fascinated by the new findings of many um, of the within the community, uh, which tell us that complex complex traits of, of animals, complex features of animals' behavior is um, or may be heavily influenced by the microbiome, uh, implying that um, the microbiome has somehow access to mm, the central nervous function uh, by not yet understood mechanisms. Um, so that's uh, getting at a point where it's really um, ch challenging and for many people still very difficult to accept uh, that uh, behavior of human or any other organism um, is actually maybe a product of the communication, the talking between the microbiome and your, your cells. And uh, um, to me, that gives uh, this type of biology also a completely new flavor and also a new direction because things what we have thought long time ago that maybe by electrophysiology and other behavior tests we can understand, we now 
again have to realize nothing makes sense but when we think about the interaction with the microbial world. Um, would you agree to that? I think so, yeah. I mean, I think some of the uh, links between the gut microbiota, say, and our behavior um, might have been slightly overextended uh, in, you know, in some discussions. I mean, I think it's kind of obvious uh, in a simple sense that our guts affect our behavior because if you get sick you feel ill your behavior changes right um, and you see I know it's I mean it seems trivial but it's we know we've known forever that there's a link right um, and actually sickness behavior in animals actually does seem to be a behavior that is fairly characteristic across animals uh, particularly mammals rather um, and it's associated with um, resting sleeping, not eating more, so probably not fueling anything that's, that's causing you illness and so on. So we've known that there is a fundamental link between behavior and, and, and the gut microbiota, and it's definitely, it's, that's undeniable. The question is how much further does it go uh, beyond that? Um, and um, certainly the capacity for the gut microbiota, which already is a complex system, to affect behavior in the brain, which is a, you know, a immeasurably complex system, is, is fascinating. And so I think it's a very exciting area for research. Um, but I think it should be done with a word of caution and the recognition that, indeed, it's, it, we know that there are links, um, but I wouldn't say we know those links are really fundamental for understanding human behavior in general. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in particular, I think all, any kind of research in that direction always must focus on causality. Can you really show that's causal uh, there? And so that requires then most likely model systems which reduce complexity or uh, otherwise uh, everything. There's a lot of hype in the field which then poisons also then uh, for the general public um, the field. The, uh, fas another fascinating aspect of course of that type of findings that um, microbes influence our body cells and there's interaction with that is um, that you may be able to manipulate the microbiome in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, we are certainly not there yet. And there is a classical um, history, probably going back to Mechnikov, uh, which sees the microbiome as kind of a, a manipulatable and for changing entity in your body. Isn't that something very, again, very exciting for the future that, uh, I mean, we cannot do much with our genome, but we may do uh, maybe a lot with our microbiome? Yes. No, I think it's a very exciting area. I mean, yeah, uh, the terminology people use is engraftment, you know, from uh, terminology from um, medicine. But the idea is that you can take um, uh, the gut microbiota of a healthy person in some cases, take a person with a particular condition, particularly this infection with this bacteria, Clostridium difficile, and you give them uh, the microbiota of a healthy um, donor and it can be curative. So that's, and also the, in, in a stable way, it seems, in many cases. Um, so there's a lot of excitement in the fact you can manipulate the microbiome. Um, the challenge is actually that beyond Clostridium difficile, this one case of infection where it's, it can be very curative, um, it's pretty very, very difficult to actually get good health outcomes. Um, and that's where we're hitting this problem of complexity. Um, we don't really know what we're doing with it when we're engineering the microbiota at the moment, but there's great promise in the fact that you can actually change someone's microbiota. It should also be treated with caution because you can permanently change the mic microbes that we carry by transferring microbes from one person to another. So that gives great potential, but it also can be kind of a little bit worrying at the same time. And so I think going forward, we have to be cautious. Um, but the idea of custom probiotics, where we really do understand uh, the, the microbes that someone carries, the interactions in those microbes, how they're affecting uh, a person's health. And then we design a, a, a cocktail of particular microbes that will persist in that person and help their prognosis, um, I think is yeah, something that we're only going to see more and more of. But it is proving to be more challenging than people hoped because there was a few test cases where it was very effective. And I think that lured us into thinking it was going to be easy. And, and it turns out not to be the case. Yeah, I think uh, that's uh, absolutely right. And oversimplifying things and uh, coming out with very quick m messages and therapies, it's certainly not very helpful for the whole thing. But the message is... Uh, uh, when I understand you, that there is a there is a exciting perspective. There's a huge but, potential. Uh, yes, yeah. but we need uh, now really experiments down to earth and focused and on causality to find out what's going on, and then maybe we can use that in in formulas and and in imprecise therapies. When I'm 
visiting other centers or here in, in our institution here and get a lot uh, to um, talking with young people, they all find that very, very exciting and they think, uh, you know, wow, um, this um, biology is taking up now very, biology is getting interdisciplinary, uh, you work with mathematicians, modelers and uh, uh, this has even, um, so in terms of uh, the social sciences impact, uh, whatever we do, theoretically, many different theoretical aspects uh, are attached by, by these issues. What to tell the young uh, generation? What does it need to be the successful uh, young researcher these days? And um, um, what would you say to them? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I mean, what, one thing I would say is... Uh, have fun in what you're doing um, but actually increasingly I'm also recommending that you learn some maths um, a lot of uh, these problems that we face in understanding complex systems are solved by at least a basic understanding of mathematics um, and computation and I think the importance of those methods is only going to increase over time and so if someone does if you you know if you're not completely averse to mathematics I would learn some maths yeah. um, brings us to the probably also the responsibility for the, the university teacher um, to do something changing teaching uh, and ch changing teaching in a direction which um, gives people the ability, the young generation, the, uh, the ability to understand other disciplines, interdisciplinary working. I mean, if you want to get a mathematician interested in your problem, you have a to understand basic math by yourself, but also you have to be able to talk about your problem in a in a language that your colleague from the other faculty or discipline is really able to understand that. Um, do you see a need in in, in changing uh, teaching? I mean, yeah, the ability to be able to take different modules and different topics that are complementary um, is something that I think can be attractive in any course any teaching. Um, historically some universities do this and some don't. So I'm from Oxford which is obviously a lovely university but actually I did my undergraduate at Cambridge and Cambridge has a degree called Natural Sciences um, and that's based on the idea of uh, being able to choose basically anything within Natural Sciences as you go through. And so you can mix up mathematics, chemistry, psychology, geology as you go through and get um, a very sort of rounded uh, education that way um, and I'm you know I may be biased because it was my education but I think it was extremely important for my own uh, training and my uh, happiness with working with different disciplines so yeah the problem is trying to do tr retroactively trying to set up those systems is, is challenging so I'm now at Oxford and it doesn't seem that we can we can get this working but yeah I'd like to yeah the good thing is and, uh, that uh, we get an increasing number of young people uh, which are really uh, fascinated by this new complexity. So they are somehow, so they, neither we, but also they do not understand yet, of course, all the details. But I think it's a very promising and uh, nice sign if young people um, get fascinated by that. And then, of course, you have to to train them and uh, put them down to earth again and uh, getting out the, you know, I always talk about the holistic picture, uh, but then you need deep reductionistic approaches to really get to function. Uh, the challenge is bringing then these details back to a whole picture. And But uh, the more young people are interested in that, I think um, that's very good for the field. And I'm, I'm very positive that this field which was, when I talk about the host microbiome field, it's probably, it, it was um, originated not from the microbiologists. No. Uh, you are a trained zoologist, as yeah. I may say, and yes. you know, I'm a trained zoologist. Uh, and so I guess, uh, so the symbiosis researchers, your social group, your social insight community, they were the drivers in this new direction now. And now many people are hooking up on that train. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the microbiome is, you know, there's currently very few people that claim expertise of the whole thing. You know, there's immunology, microbiology, physiology, so many disciplines you'd really need to master. And certainly, I think, you know, um, yeah, you know, I'll never be a master in all of these. But the new generation that's happening, you know, people are training in different labs and doing different components of it. Um, and we will see the real, they're emerging, these real microbiome researchers. They understand ecology and evolution as well, I think. Um, and there's now, I think, a few people that can lay claim to it. Uh, 
but it requires interdisciplinarity like I think we haven't seen before yeah, to achieve it. So where will be the, where you think will be the field of the microbiome research and understanding the social life of bacteria and the interaction with the hosts? Where do you think this will be in five years or in 10 years? I think, I mean, it's starting to happen already, but I think the big change is to go to experimentation uh, rather than observation. So uh, the microbiome field was characterized by, you know, rightfully so, characterized by a lot of observations, a lot of sequencing. Who's there? Who's there at different times? You know, um, and it's generated a vast amount of valuable data. But now we're at the stage where we really want to go in, test causality, uh, see, see what a particular bug is doing, um, remove that bug, add it back in under different conditions, change the host's uh, genetics to see what they're doing in return and so on, and really try and manipulate the system. So in five years, I would hope we are at the stage where we're starting to see um, custom probiotic uh, uh, cocktails, you know, sets of bacteria that we know work together and in a particular position, sorry, in a particular condition would um, help someone and also stay in that person and, and help them. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's about... It's going from observation of the system to experiments and then to manipulation, and I think that's where we're moving, yeah. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin, for coming here, and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you.